This is a 747 carrying a 70-foot-long rocket, and it's moments away from delivering a satellite into Earth's orbit. Whoa, hang on, actually. Let's go back a bit. This is a satellite. It's basically a big bundle of electronics floating miles above our heads in the blackness of space. Satellites help us monitor our environment, track planes and ships, keep our world safe, and so much more. Just like our computers, new technology is transforming the way we build these spacecraft, allowing us to do a whole lot more with a whole lot less. Problem is, it's not always easy for these spacecraft to get where they need to go. See, it's not enough just to get to space, because space is really, really big. Satellites need to get to a specific orbit at a specific time in order to do their job. And that's hard when you're hitching a ride on someone else's giant rocket. Richard Branson and a group of world-class engineers decided this was a problem worth tackling. Fast forward four years of really hard work with a lot of math, a lot of science, and years perfecting the careful science of taming fire. And that brings us back here. Meet Cosmic Girl and Launcher One. This unique air launch system takes it a global network of spaceports to give small satellites more options for when and where they fly into orbit. Technology allows us to look inward and out, to explore and reflect, and to push the boundaries of what is possible. More excited to be a part of that adventure. All right, everybody, welcome to our latest edition of the Leadership Long Beach Fireside Chats. I'm Nima Novin. Um, I want to welcome our guest, uh, Will Pomerantz of Virgin Orbit. Today's session is uh, sometimes it is rocket science. Um, Will is employee number one of Virgin Orbit, a premier satellite launch service. They were formed in 2017 and are part of the Virgin Group along with Virgin Galactic. Virgin Orbit HQ is right here in Long Beach and has been an incredible part of our community and has also helped us host some site visits for our Leadership Long Beach Business Days over the last few years. That has really been one of the memorable parts of our program. Um, if you've flown in, about, in and out of Long Beach Airport recently, you might have seen their 747 parked outside. Um, Cosmic Girl lives at our airport. So, um, Will, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me back. I'm sorry I can't do the site visit this time around, um, but happy we can at least uh, talk virtually. Awesome. Well, we'll get into that a little later, too. But uh, uh, thanks for joining us. We have folks on the Zoom call. We also have a community watching on our Facebook page. So I'm um, excited to broadcast, broadcast this out to all our alumni. Um, Will, why don't we jump into it? Why don't you tell us about yourself and how you got to where you are today leading special projects at Virgin Orbit? Sure. Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, I'm a lifelong space nerd. Um, and that's kind of core to everything. Actually, I'll caveat that a little bit. Um, I, I, I was a space nerd as a little kid in the way I think all um, kids are space nerds, or at least a lot of them. Um, but I never thought it was an actual industry that I could work in. And I think a big part of that is because I, I started wearing these when I was just eight years old. Uh, and back then, at least wearing glasses was enough to disqualify you from being an astronaut. Um, as, as an eight-year-old, uh, I pretty much assumed astronaut was the only job that existed in the aerospace industry. Uh, even though I really should have known better, I, my family moved around a lot when I was a kid, but I, I lived in Houston, Texas for a couple of years and Orlando, Florida for a couple of years. Those are big, big aerospace cities, so I probably should have known better, but never really occurred to me until I was in college that, uh, that aerospace was an actual field that employed lots of people, uh, including astronauts and the folks in mission control, but also lots of engineers and scientists and business people and lawyers and graphic designers and everything else. Uh, and once I sort of figured that out, um, my heart tugged me right in that direction and I, I, was, I had the bug for life. Um, so have sort of devoted my career to uh, to being in space in, in a couple different ways. I started out as a scientist, so my degree is in planetary science. I used to be a Martian geologist, if you can believe that that was a thing, uh, still is a thing. Um, but, but eventually I, I sort of felt a slightly different calling. Um, I love space missions. I think they're really important socially, economically, you know, in, in pretty much every aspect of life. The thing I really dislike about them is how much they cost and therefore how rare they are both uh, in sort of time and in uh, the, the amount of people 
and the diversity of, of individuals and institutions that it can afford to do them. So I sort of felt my calling being maybe on, hey, can I, uh, instead of doing the space missions myself, can I go and help the space missions be a little cheaper and therefore uh, a little more inclusive, uh, a little more frequent? Because um, I just thought that that takes all the good space already does and it amplifies it massively. Um, I really uh, also felt this calling. Um, I have a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit and I, I felt a real calling to help entrepreneurs get more involved in space. It used to be that entrepreneurs were really priced out of the space industry because you were talking sort of a, a billion dollars in a decade uh, before you saw any returns on anything. And uh, I don't know a whole lot of entrepreneurs that are, are interested in those kind of numbers. Um, so I, I really felt a calling to, to, uh, to try and lower all those numbers. Um, so have done that in a couple different ways. I got to work at a, 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 one of the bigger nonprofits in the field called the XPRIZE Foundation, which is based here in Southern California for many years, running some big aerospace prize competitions uh, called Technology Inducement Prizes. I got to run some from NASA and some for uh, Google. And then um, about nine and a half years ago, I jumped over to Virgin uh, and joined uh, what's now my sister company, Virgin Galactic, the human space flight company, the space tourism company. I was not employee number one, but I was probably 35 or 40 or something. Like so rel relatively early at the time when that was very much a rapid growth startup. Um, and I came in with this title of VP of Special Projects, which is a title I've always liked because it's inherently meaningless and allows me to do lots of different things and have fun in lots of different ways and contribute to lots of different parts of the program. Um, my job uh, was both to fight fires in the classic startup way where there's always you know, some major problem that you didn't know existed yesterday and you got to solve by tomorrow. Um, but it was also to help identify opportunities um, and to take a list that I certainly didn't develop, it was invented way before I got there, uh, but to take what was pretty literally a, a list of bullet points on a napkin for other business areas that we could go into and to go and kind of flesh it out and say, okay, of those, which is a good idea and which is not so good, um, what do we need to do right now versus what's five, 10, 20 years out in the future? What should we do ourselves versus partnering or joint venture or contract out or whatever else? And one of the things that was pretty high on that list was this idea that maybe Virgin should get in the business of putting smaller satellites into low Earth orbit. Uh, and so as I sort of worked down my list, I got to that one pretty early on. Uh, and I will freely admit, I started out a huge skeptic uh, about the idea. Um, I thought it was possible. I just didn't know if it was profitable or even sustainable. Um, but as we sort of, uh, not just me, but me and a team of people much smarter than I started to put our, our ear to the ground uh, and figure out, you know, was there actually a, a need there uh, in the community, um, an economic need and a social need, ideally both of them, uh, I was really blown away by, by what I saw. We, we sort of caught the early rumblings of what's now, I think, a full-fledged full -fledged revolution in the satellite industry where satellites have gone from things that were the size of a school bus and cost a billion dollars to being things that are the size of a toaster oven and they cost $10,000. Um, and, uh, and that has had a huge impact on the speed of innovation, uh, on the number of entities that are interested in it. It's, uh, it's opened up entirely new investment pools. Uh, and the thing that was really lacking was the launch part of the equation. Uh, and so we discovered that that was an area where maybe we could do a little bit of good uh, and make a little bit of money along the way. And that was a pretty nice combination. Um, so got to help us uh, start up start up the effort. Um, and uh, it went from being, yeah, a couple of folks uh, sort of working in the back office of, of Virgin Galactic and using the tools in the machine shop when they weren't too busy and, and kind of scraping together a little money on the side um, to uh, in early 2015, we moved into our factory right in Long Beach, uh, just north of the airport, uh, with, which has uh, about 180,000 square feet of manufacturing space. And we've ramped up to now we're about a five or 600, 600 person company, um, still based in Long Beach. We have another facility up in Mojave, but almost all of our employees are there. And we got a, a factory that's not quite as full of people as it was pre-COVID, um, but still has a lot of people working hard and is still uh, is still full of rockets that we're uh, that we're gearing up to launch. Awesome. So that's probably long-winded, but that's the, my version of a quick quick introduction. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, in these sessions, we talk a lot about leadership philosophies and, and leadership principles. Um, you know, you don't really have a blueprint there. Can you talk about how you even start get started in these things? How do you decide you want to launch a rocket off of a seven forty seven? And and how does not having like a you know someone that's done it before you you know inspire you to be a you know a different kind of leader? Yeah. Um, well, it's funny, you know, 
one of the things that really makes us stand out within aerospace is probably one of the things that makes us much more similar to every other industry. Um, so the way a lot of people often like to compare us and my, my boss's boss, Richard Branson, uh, to some of the other folks who are doing really cool things in space, Elon Musk, um, right here in Southern California, Jeff Bezos, uh, primarily in the Seattle area, uh, Paul Allen before he passed away, Bob Bigelow, a, a, a bunch of others. Um, and um, Richard is comes from a very different perspective than Elon or Jeff in particular, and that sort of has led us in a very different direction. I think uh, Elon and Jeff, uh, and I do not mean this in any sort of negative way at all. I think I think they've both done really wonderful things for our industry, um, but they're both very technical. You know, they come from an engineering and physics, computer science kind of a background. They considered themselves engineers first, uh, and they sort of had um, a very specific technology and a very specific mission that they wanted to undertake, and they didn't see anyone else doing it. So they sort of said, well, damn it, I'm gonna go and do it myself. Um, Richard comes from a pretty different perspective. He's not an engineer or uh, a college graduate or student, he, you know, he barely finished high school. He's very dyslexic, dyslexic. He's not gonna design a rocket for you and be the, the chief engineer of the, of the Dragon capsule as, as Elon is or, or, or whatever else. He really comes from the perspective of being a customer. Um, and that, that's really how he started all of his businesses, whether it's Virgin Atlantic or Virgin Records or Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit. He sort of started out as someone who wanted to buy a service and discovered either that he couldn't buy a service or that he could buy it, but he'd be kind of treated like crap um, in, in a way that didn't seem necessary. You know, that, that's the whole reason he founded an airline is he had he was treated really badly by another airline that canceled his flight. And so he, he said, well, there's gotta be a better way to do this. Uh, a same sort of thing happened for his space companies. You know, he started Virgin Galactic because um, he was a teenager when humans landed on the moon. And that was a formative experience for him as it was for so many people around the planet. He sort of said, hey, surely by the time I grow up, I'll get to do that. Um, lo and behold, 50 years later, he hasn't gotten to do that. Um, and he's never going to get to do that as a government astronaut. So he sort of said, well, I know the technology exists. Uh, I know not only do I really want this, I would pay a lot of money for it. And I would accept some risk for it. And I would train for it and everything else. And chances are I'm not the only one who was inspired by watching the most popular television event of all time. <laughs> uh, so maybe there's other people like me. Uh, and since I know the technology exists and I believe there's this pennant market for it, maybe I should be developing the technology to access that pennant market. And so voila, you've got, got Virgin Galactic. Virgin Orbit started in sort of a similar way. We, once Richard found out what people were doing with these small satellites and how they could be used to do missions, everything from monitoring climate change to improving the efficiency of shipping and logistic fleets to enforcing treaties to whatever else. Um, and then he discovered that uh, all this innovation was really going through a bottleneck where you could, you could build the satellites affordably, but you couldn't launch them affordably, or at least you couldn't launch them when you wanted to, where you wanted to affordably. He said, oh, well, if we can go and do that, then we're enabling 100 different business plans. And that's a nice thing to do for us and, and, and for the world. Uh, and so we, we really came to it from a very customer centric kind of position, which is like business 101, I feel in almost every other industry. It's obviously like be customer centric, but weirdly that is like totally foreign in the aerospace industry. Aerospace is always very technology centric. It's, uh, you know, it's let's just build a bigger rocket because you, often it's had sort of a political influence is a country we don't like has a bigger rocket. So just go build one that's bigger than theirs and we'll figure out what to do with it later. And I don't really care how much it costs, right? That 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 was the first 50 years of the aerospace industry. It's like US, Russia, US, Russia, US, Russia, unlimited budgets, really amazing engineering happening, but not customer focused at all. Um, so, uh, and, and that is still to a large extent how much of the aerospace industry is. We, we decided to start, oh no, let's, let's start from that customer focus again. So let's go and actually talk to these people building small satellites and say, hey, what do you need? You know, you don't just need a ride to space. You probably have something in mind, right? You don't just want to catch the bus um, because as, as, in, as, a, as efficient, environmentally efficient and as cost efficient as the bus is, um, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess not too many people on the Zoom call ride the bus all that often because you prefer your car or you prefer an Uber or you prefer a taxi or you prefer a whatever else because those things pick you up from your house and they drop you off at your destination. And if you're one minute late, 
you just pay an extra dollar for the Uber waiting fee. It's not like you miss the bus and you got to wait an hour and you get to pick what route you take and you get to pick what music you listen to in the car. And, and that's, uh, that's valuable for you. Uh, we sort of saw a very similar thing in, in the satellite world where people said, yes, I can get a ride to space. There are some amazing rockets that work really well and are exquisitely designed and manufactured, but they're built for these school bus size satellites that are paying a billion dollars a ride. And I don't want to bring my toaster oven and either pay a billion, you know, pay $100 million for a rocket for a thing that cost me $10,000 to build. But I also don't want to be wedged in the back of someone else's bus and go entirely on their schedule. So they would tell us things like, you know, how much you can carry to orbit is important and the price tag is important, but your flexibility is just as important. I want to be able to leave on my schedule. I want to be weather resilient. I want to be able to fly from lots of different places on the globe. As I go out and I sell satellites and services to my customers who are global in nature, I want to be able to say, I can bring the whole thing to you. I can bring every part of the value chain to you because now that gives me chances to, to wheel and deal in all new ways. And so I think what we found ourselves doing was we were just sort of uh, our engineers, we, we were, we were at, causing our engineers to solve a different problem. Um, instead of just telling them, hey, build me the biggest damn rocket you can, which is what most rocket companies have done. We said, no, you, you got to build me the fastest, most flexible, most responsive, most mobile, blah, blah, blah. And that led us to some, you know, unsurprising that that led us to some some pretty, pretty different answers. Uh, it also took us, uh, gave us this ability to kind of go and cobble together a lot of existing ideas from experimental projects in the early days of space that had been sort of tried but not pursued or at least not pursued for long because they weren't in service of this always go bigger and bigger and bigger goal and we said well someone else has demonstrated a, a fundamental technology there and left it collecting dust on the shelf because it didn't work for that job but it works for our job so let's go and scoop that idea up um, and uh, and put it into practice and, and you know modernize a little bit for uh, for, our, for our current world Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, next question. I kind of touched on it earlier, but you know, your headquarters is in Long Beach. Um, there's a rich aerospace history here with Boeing and Douglas in the past. Um, I'm assuming that's part of the answer to this question, but what led you all to, to pick Long Beach to set up shop and what's been your experience with the city so far? Yeah, that, that is almost all of why we are in Long Beach. Um, it's certainly all why we're in LA and sort of the broadly the, the South Bay-ish area. Um, you know, people have been doing aerospace and doing it incredibly well from since there was an aerospace, you know, based basically. Uh, and so what that meant to us was uh, talent. It was it was the availability of people, individual employees, contractors, but also some of the supply chain, you know, you could find machine shops that are used to building aerospace grade parts. Um, so, uh, so it was that plus being able to find, you know, a building that was the right size and where we could do wild things like build build rocket engines and, and everything else in there. And that would be appropriate from a zoning perspective and a safety perspective and, and everything else. Um, so we, uh, we, we, we took, took, took the leap of faith and moved in uh, first of March, 2015. And uh, we knew pretty quickly we'd made the right choice. Uh, what happened was literally the, the, the very first weekend that we had the keys to the building we, uh, we held an open house slash job fair. Uh, and at the time, I think we had about 35 employees. We were looking to hire 50 to 100 over the course of the next 12 months. Uh, and so my boss asked me to put together this job fair and he said, uh, I'll be really happy if you can get a thousand people to come stand in line to enter an, uh, literally an empty building. We didn't have the electricity turned on in most of the building yet. Uh, we had to have porta potties, all that kind of stuff. If you can get a thousand people to line up for an empty building to talk about 50 to 100 jobs, I'll feel pretty happy. Um, and this is not a credit to me, it's a credit to the, the residents of Long Beach and the surrounding community. Uh, we stopped counting attendees at around 11 a.m. when we'd already hit 6,000 people. Um, that were queued up. Um, and it was a combination of, I think some people just were curious about what a Richard Branson rocket factory would look like and were a little disappointed when they realized that it was empty. <laughs> um, uh, but it was a lot of people who had, you know, worked, had done awesome things in their career. They'd worked, you know, catty corner to us, uh, building C-17s for Boeing um, or the, further back, McDonald, Donald Douglas, Douglas, um, you know, all, all the other parts of the aviation supply chain. We actually ended up hiring some people who had worked literally at the same address, you know, 20 or 30 years earlier in their career uh, when they were when they were young bucks and does uh, entering the industry uh, who are now coming back and, and building rockets in the same spot. 
Um, so yeah, that that that's been wonderful. Uh, I think the reception from the city has has been great. Um, we're we're uh, we try to be in the position of not of being good neighbors and not asking for too much. Um, I won't get too much into my personal politics, but I see a lot of companies that sort of hold cities hostage and ask for a huge stimulus checks and rent loans and whatever else. And, and, and we really haven't done that, which I presume makes our city leadership pretty happy. I think the biggest thing we've ever asked for was a crosswalk uh, and then uh, and, and some, so, you know, a, a couple rush jobs on permits and, and, and things like that. Um, but, you know, the mayor's office has been great. The city council has been great. And mainly our neighbors have been great. You know, we, we, uh, we hear all the time from, uh, from, the ones that make me happiest are the kids, uh, the kids and the teachers. Uh, we, pre-COVID, basically every Saturday we were running uh, students through the factory for, for tours of the rocket factory, which was a, a super cool thing. And I don't think it's a coincidence that since we moved in in 2015, um, it's now become a little bit of a haven for small rocket companies. Um, so uh, one of our, our, our closest peer is a New Zealand based company called Rocket Lab. They now have their American headquarters literally across the street from us. Um, we have a company called Spin Launch that is on the same street about two blocks down. And now another company called Relativity has just moved in uh, just south of the airport. Uh, so that's that's four rocket company or four small launch companies, uh, at least in uh, in Long Beach proper, which I think means Long Beach can probably credibly claim to be Rocket City USA. Uh, although there's some folks in Alabama who'd be very, very upset. Say nothing of the ones in Florida and Texas uh, if we were to use that name. Awesome. You guys had a, a huge day almost exactly a month ago um, with your test mission. Can you walk us through, you know, the goals of that mission and what accomplishments you took out of it? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, like I said, we start. We opened the factory in March 2015. Even though we'd been sort of noodling around ideas before that, I can sort of sort of consider that the birth of the of the project. Um, so we've been working for a little over five years um, and trying to do an awful lot. Um, we're we're pretty different from our peers in a, in a, in a number of ways. Uh, one is that. Basically everyone but us in the industry, when you're trying to develop a new rocket, you focus all your resources on developing the first rocket. And then once you've done that, you figure out how to build a second rocket. Once you've done that, you think about building a factory. Um, and then maybe once you've built a factory, you think about building some new launch sites. So you have more than one place to launch the rocket. Um, we decided to do things a little bit differently in that we were focused on building the rocket and the factory simultaneously. So we've already fully stood up our factory. And then the other big difference about us, um, for anyone who doesn't know the basic details of our system, um, that's there you go. That, that's actually our launch vehicle behind me, and it looks a little different from most rockets um, because we use this old, we sort of revived this old technique called air launch, uh, which means instead of uh, launching our rocket from a launch pad on the ground at Cape Canaveral or Vandenberg Air Force Base, we take this uh, 70 foot long. 57,000 pound-ish rocket, and we strap it under the wing of this Boeing 747. Um, and that, that's how we get that sort of mobility and flexibility and responsiveness that I was talking about earlier, because our entire launch site moves. Um, and I love Cape Canaveral as much as anyone else, uh, but it's not very good at moving to another place if you've got bad weather coming or if it's just not logistically convenient. This thing was literally built from scratch to go anywhere on the planet in about 12 hours. Um, so we had to build our entire launch site at the same time as we were building our rocket, at the same time as we were building our factory. Uh, so there's a lot of work, um, a lot of people working long hours, uh, really hard, but kind of loving what we were doing. Um, this test that we did uh, on Memorial Day, so almost exactly a month ago, as you say, was sort of our big chance to test everything all at once. So we'd been testing the plane in the air for a while. We'd been testing the rocket on the ground. We built lots of different rockets. This was the first time we took a rocket, we fully fueled it, stuck it under the wing of the airplane. We took off, flew out over the Pacific Ocean. We dropped the rocket off the wing of the airplane and we lit the engine for the very first time. Um, and that was really exciting. I won't bog you all down with all the technical details, although I'm more than happy to get into it if anyone is curious. Um, but when we started this program, everyone said the hardest part was gonna be just getting the rocket to ignite. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to ignite rockets normally now you're talking about a rocket that's free falling through the air at 30,000 feet with all the vibration and weightlessness and temperature differentials and everything that that implies. Um, so we were able to achieve uh, actually a picture perfect drop, a picture perfect ignition. We got through sort of the, the earliest part of the flight, which was the hardest part of the flight. And that was our main goal for the day. 
We didn't get through a whole lot more than that. And we all had hoped that we would uh, get lucky and, and get a little further than that. But we were able to hit sort of our, our biggest goal for the day, which was a huge step forward, sort of retired our, our main risk of the program. It's one of those funny things where it's sort of like we aced the hardest question on the exam and then probably stumbled over a pretty easy question right, right after that, which is both a little frustrating, but it's like, hey, if you're going to miss one, like, hey, it's nice that we know we solved the hardest one. We, we, we know how to get that again next time. We'll, we'll, we'll get back up and at it uh, pretty soon. Uh, and that's really what we're focused on now. Um, we, we are feeling very happy about our decision because we knew the likelihood of that happening. You know, the, the statistics for all rockets launching for the first time is about a 50% failure rate. And we knew we were doing a whole new kind of rocket from a whole new kind of launch system. So just history suggested that odds were not gonna be good as hard as we were trying and as hopeful as we were. Uh, so we'd sort of taken this unusual decision to not only build up the factory, but we'd actually already built sort of the next six rockets. Um, and so what we're doing now is putting the finishing touches on the next rocket so we can get up and try again. Obviously, we want to be make sure we've been really thorough in learning all the lessons of what went right and what went wrong in the first flight. We had some of each of those. Um, so we're not going to rush things. But the nice part is, you know, we're not sitting around waiting to build stuff. We've got stuff that we just need to figure out, okay, you need to change it or use it differently or swap out one piece or just test it differently or, or whatever else. And, and that's really what we're focused on right now. Awesome. Yeah, one of the coolest parts of that day was watching the interaction with, you know, Elon tweeting you guys and back and forth. And, you know, while those are your competitors and your rivals, it seems like everybody's really focused on this goal of just revolution, revolutionizing space. Um, can you talk about that? You talked about it a little bit earlier, but you know, how do you look at when SpaceX is doing a launch and yeah. Yeah. I've always felt really lucky to be in the aerospace industry because for the most part, we're all genuine fans of the entire industry. Um, and it's also small enough that there aren't a huge amount of jerks. Uh, there are some jerks, uh, like in any other industry, but for the most part, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, I mentioned, um, sort of our, our closest peer company is this company called Rocket Lab that are now literally our neighbors in Long Beach. Every time they launch, we've got their, their web stream up on the big screen in our office and they get a big standing ovation when it works and, and, and everything else. Uh, you know, uh, that doesn't necessarily happen when we're competing for customers. <laughs> we, we don't share their wins there, but when, when they have the technology that works, like that's awesome because the world needs a hell of a lot more launch than it has right now. We just need more options flying more often with more sort of uh, more, more choices from different countries, more resiliency. Um, and even if we were to succeed beyond our wildest dreams, that would not be enough. And the same is true of them. Um, so yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a pretty good amount of camaraderie. I thought it was really kind of, uh, as you mentioned, when, when we had a, a launch that went uh, pretty well, but not nearly as well as we would have liked it to. And you know, even though uh, I think we'd done a pretty good job helping the public understand what we were trying to do, you know, anytime the the headline ends in failure, <laughs> uh, you know, pe pe people can have the ability to pile on, uh, especially on the internet in 2020 when everybody piles on to everyone for everything. Um, so it was nice to see some folks who, you know, I think in another industry probably would have been trying to score cheap points. Instead, we're saying, hey, that was really impressive for a first try, you know. Uh, as Elon mentioned, you know, we they failed their first four times, I think, or it took failed the first three times, got it on their fourth try, and and so there was a lot of patting on the back and people reaching out and saying, hey, I, I hope you're holding your heads high because today was actually a really good day, um, and uh, and that that's that's a really positive thing that I hope we'll we'll continue to to pay forward uh, as others have paid it to us. Thanks. Well, we're going to shift a little bit, but for the folks that are on the line um, or on the Zoom, if you want to drop any questions in the chat, we'll we'll start queuing them up here shortly. Um, we got a couple that we just want to discuss before we move there, though. But um, shifting to COVID-19, Will, and some of the impacts on your day-to-day, -day, um, two things to talk about. I imagine it's really hard to um, build rockets and launch them off a plane virtually. And then two, um, Virgin Orbit got an emergency youth authorization to start building respirators when that was a really you know critical issue um, just, I think, like a month or two ago when there was a big shortage. So how have you adapted? Um, yeah. your day operations, but also yep. how have you shifted towards building respirators when you have another mission that's obviously top of mind? Yeah, yeah, it's a wild world. Uh, that That is for sure. So as you say, um, you know, a, a lot of us, I, I can do most of my work from home, um, but you can't build rockets from home and you can't launch rockets from home. Uh, we have a, a reasonable percentage of our workforce that simply cannot do any part of their job unless they are physically on site, you know, turning a wrench or flying a plane or, or whatever else the case may be. 
Um, now, thankfully, we were uh, we were in, and remain uh, classified as an essential business because of the nature of our work. Um, so even when uh, both the city and the county and the state uh, all issued their shelter in place orders, we were exempt from that. Um, but we uh, we are a virgin company. We we try. I know every company says they like to be a family, but we try to actually live that and didn't want to put our employees uh, in a harm's way. So what we did was um, uh, sort of as soon as it became clear that COVID was more than just the flu and it was going to be a real thing and it was going to be around for a while. Uh, we sent all of our employees home for a week with full pay and we said, hey, go take care of your families figure out how to live in this new world, stock up on toilet paper, you know, whatever else you need to do. Uh, and we really used that week to figure out, okay, how do we go and reconfigure our workspace so that we can bring back in the people who need to be physically on site and we can do that safely. And we did that in a couple ways. You know, the biggest part is just tell people, most people, hey, if you don't need to come in, don't come in. Um, so on any given day, we've got something like 80% of our workforce at home. Um, because yeah, if you're, uh, you know, if you're the human resources team or the accounting team or the graph, you're like, you don't, you don't need to be there. That's fine. Uh, Zoom is pretty good. Um, uh, and that just allows us to really reduce the population density in the building, which makes getting six foot spacing much, much, much easier. We do have a pretty darn big bill is 180,000 square feet of manufacturing space. Um, so when you've got 600 people in there, that starts to get crowded. When you got 100 people in there, it starts to feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, the other nice thing is we sort of come from an industry that is used to thinking analytically about risk. Uh, it's used to dealing with inherent hazards. I mean, we literally are blowing stuff up on purpose all the time and dealing with rocket fuels and, and big heavy machinery. It's also an industry where we're, we're all used to wearing personal protective equipment. Um, and so, you know, we had N95 masks on hand and we ended up donating some of those, but we kept some of those for, for work that needed to continue to happen. We had people who are used to, yeah, you really should you really should be wearing a face covering and you really should be wearing gloves. You really should be washing your hands and here's how you wash them properly. Like we had a team that, that kind of got that. Um, and so between sort of building on that experience and then doing all the things that most companies are doing of adding more hand washing stations and putting up barricades between the desks and having the increasing the, the frequency of all janitorial services, things like that. Uh, we've been able to keep the building yeah, at about sort of 20% occupancy um, all the way through and knock on wood, we have not had a single case um, of COVID-19 yet, which, uh, which hopefully, hopefully will continue. Um, it did also, it had some funny things. Uh, so, you know, we have a, a mission control for our flight. Um, and if you've ever watched, you know, a NASA flight or, uh, or, uh, or any sci-fi movie, you're familiar with mission controls and it's, a bunch of computers all sitting right next to each other with people kind of crammed in there leaning over each other's shoulders and so we had to go and totally reconfigure our mission control and uh, there was and, and that sort of drives some interesting uh, things sorry my dog is speaking up here uh, the joys of working from home uh so uh so, so that's that the other big project that we did as, as you mentioned was uh, we've taken on a project to build some um, emergency ventilators this is just as you know everyone in the world sort of realized that one of the many tragedies of COVID-19 was going to be that there wasn't enough of key pieces of medical equipment, whether that was masks or whatever else. Um, we recognized that we had to do something. If I can get him to quiet. Sorry, I'm sure that's the mailman. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we, we've got a, a workforce that's mostly engineers. They're all kind of tinkerers. They all have a problem solving mentality. And so what we found was you could, you could just sort of tell in the early days everyone on our team, you know, they'd come to the office, they'd work on rockets throughout the day, then they'd go home and they'd just sit in front of their computer trying to figure out, okay, can I 3D print face shields? Or can I, like, what, what can I do? I, I, I know how to design stuff, I know how to build stuff, I've got some equipment, I, I wanna help not only protect my family, but protect the world. And one of the people who had that sort of feeling was, uh, was our CEO, Dan Hart. Dan, you know, he's an executive now, but he, he was an engineer for the first 30 or so years of his career. He was nerding out on all this kind of stuff. And we had sort of people on the team who kept suggesting, yeah, you know, uh, we, should, we, should be making, we should be making N95 masks or we should be making whatever else. Um, and they all sounded like interesting ideas to us, but we also recognized we don't, we don't know, we don't, we're not doctors, we're not epidemiologists, we don't, we don't understand everything that's going on in this. We don't actually know what would be most useful. And so Dan put in a call to Governor Newsom and said, uh, you know, Mr. Governor, um, I've got a brand new factory and I've got 500 really smart engineers and I'm willing to use them. What do you need? 
and the governor put us in touch uh, with the California Emergency Medical Services Authority. They in turn put us in touch with this group called the Bridge Ventilator Consortium, which is a group of primarily uh, MD PhDs and clinicians, mostly at universities and university hospital systems based out of UC Irvine. And what they were doing was they were looking at specifically at the field of ventilators and saying there at the time it looked even worse than it looks now, but it still doesn't look that great. They said there's not nearly enough ventilators. Um, the, uh, the ventilators we have cost a huge amount of money. We can't build them quickly, especially not right now because the supply chain has been so impacted by the virus, not only here in the US, but abroad. Um, and also they said the ventilators we have uh, do way more than they need to for the overwhelming majority of COVID-19 patients. The ventilators are designed for the people who have the worst cases and the most comorbidities and everything else. So if you take your average run-of-the-mill COVID-19 patient who's in serious condition, they don't need a ventilator that's anywhere near as capable as what the hospitals don't have enough of. Uh, and so they sort of said, hey, if someone could go and build a ventilator that frankly is much worse, but if the trade-off for that is you can build them much faster and much cheaper, and you can still build them right now with all the impacts on the supply chain, you could save a lot of lives um, because you could free up the more sophisticated machines to go only to the people who need them. And then you use these less sophisticated machines to help the much broader number of people. Uh, and so we started looking into it. There were a few open source efforts of people doing some really cool work to design very, very, very cheap systems. Um, they had a lot of great ideas, but none of them had a factory and none of them had all the ideas. Um, and a lot of them were in other countries. And so they were working to different regulatory regimes or whatever else. Um, and so we just said, well, what the heck? Uh, I think we can do this. Uh, and so we designed um, our own, what we call a bridge ventilator, this sort of um, ventilator that doesn't do all the jobs, but it does a limited set of jobs very well and, and very affordably. Uh, I think from the, uh, the time from the first having the idea to having uh, some working units was about four days. Um, we, uh, we had iterated to a second generation that we started sending out to doctors about a week after that. And a month later, we had a finished unit that we got an FDA approval to start distributing um, for them. Um, so that, that's been a really exciting project. We've now built about 600 of them. Um, almost all of them have gone to the state of California. Um, and this is sort of a weird thing to say about a product we're proud of building. I don't think they're being used, thank God. Um, they are mainly going to replenish the stockpile that had been totally drained um, and was like literally empty. Um, so California has been filling that, that back up in case we have a second wave as it kind of looks like we might. Um, so none of them have been used yet, but, but they're now there. Um, the other thing we, we've been able to do, and actually there was just a big announcement about this yesterday, is we took our design and we now are providing it totally free of charge to manufacturers in other countries. Uh, and we just, uh, just uh, there was a big announcement yesterday where we partnered with um, um, uh, a couple major philanthropists, uh, a, a guy named Jeff Skoll who founded eBay, uh, and most importantly, a guy named Strive Masaiwa, who's I think the most successful African entrepreneur of all time, is a Zimbabwean who started a telecoms company. Uh, is worth it, worth more than a billion dollars. Uh, and uh, I've gotten to know him a little bit. He's like the nicest, coolest human being <laughs> I've ever interacted with, at least over a Zoom screen. I've never met him in real life. Um, but they have now funded um, a thousand of these ventilators to be manufactured and distributed totally free of charge throughout Africa, where they are so needed. There are like entire countries that have two ventilators and are anticipating needing a thousand ventilators, you know, by next month. Uh, so a thousand of them already being built and paid for, uh, probably another nine, nine or 10,000 on the way after that. Uh, and that's just been, man, if you had told me uh, in 2019 that I would be on a Zoom call with the uh, president of South Africa and chair of the African Union uh, and, uh, and all these philanthropists talking about building ventilators for a pandemic, like none of us could have ever predicted that. But it's been, uh, it's been a fun, fulfilling project to work on. Um, and, uh, and nicely now it seems like the need in the U S is, is low enough that we've been pulling our people off that project and putting them back onto building next year's rockets. Um, but now we know we've got a design it's permitted or it's, you know, it's got the right regulatory approvals. It's, it's ready to go. And we know how to build them pretty quickly if heaven forbid, um, the situation calls for it. Awesome. That's a great story. And I know everybody on the call and in the community thanks you and uh, Virgin Orbit for jumping on that. That was a really cool story to see coming, you know, out of our community and one of our companies in our backyard. So it's been a been a real pleasure. Thank thank you for the kind words. And yeah. you know, we were happy to do it. Yeah.
You mentioned um, your CEO, Dan Hart, earlier in that question. Um, just today, he released a blog, um, you know, pivoting the conversation a little bit towards Virgin Orbit's commitment to diversity. Yeah. Um, I used to work in aerospace. I worked at Boeing. Um, just looking at Virgin Orbit, I, I can see a lot younger age demographic. But um, from your personal experience or stuff you've seen at Virgin Orbit specifically, how are you guys championing diversity? Um, what kind of programs do you have to make sure that people coming in reflect that diversity of, you know, Long Beach and the broader community and uh, anything interesting that you've seen from a program perspective? Yeah, happy to. And thanks for bringing it up, especially uh, with today being Juneteenth. So for anyone who, who doesn't have an aerospace background, I I'll just say the aerospace industry is horrible about diversity and inclusion. Full stop. It's terrible. Um, if you look at the numbers, whether you're looking by gender or you're looking by ethnicity, you're looking at basically anything except for veteran status at which we do great. Uh, everything else we do awful. Um, and what we find ourselves at Virgin Orbit is we have cleared a depressingly low bar, which does not mean we're anywhere close to good enough. Um, so in the blog post you mentioned today, in addition to having um, you know a bunch of uh, hopefully eloquent thoughts, I thought they were eloquent at least, but he's my boss, so maybe I'm biased. Um, we also published all of our demographics. Um, for ethnicity and for gender, both company-wide and uh, on the senior leadership team. Uh, and again, I, I think the demographics show we do better than our community, but if you compare us to like the LA County workforce, which is probably a good ideal for us to shoot towards, we got a hell of a long way to go. Um, this isn't a new, even though clearly we, like everyone else in the world, have a new focus on it with everything that's been happening with the Black Lives Matter movement, everything since the murder of George Floyd. Uh, everyone is going back and looking at this much more closely, thank goodness. Uh, we've been thinking about it before that, though, and had been trying to make a concerted effort on that. And it's, it's a mix, you know, like with everyone else, it's got to be a mix between how do you recruit people into the company and then how do you keep them there how do you how do you actually include them in decisions how do you make sure that they're getting the promotions and the awards and bonuses and recognition that they deserve that they're involved in conversations uh, and that's something that we try to be thoughtful about you know even prior uh, prior to covid back when it was appropriate to bring in guest speakers physically into the factory we we brought in some the the um the one that sort of stands out in my mind, uh, who happens to have been the most recent one we brought in pre-COVID was uh, Dr. Rua Benjamin from Princeton University, who wrote a great book, I think called Race and Technology, just about the how, how systemic bias and racism can, can um, you know, leak into everything from how face ID works on your phone to how, whether Siri's voice is a man's or a woman, so like all these other kinds of things. And so we, we, we tried to expand people's mind and uh, in, in all those other kinds of ways. Um, um, but we got, we got a lot more work to do. Um, we do, we do do pretty well on our executive team. So that tells me that's one part of inclusion that we've been pretty successful for. Uh, but there's others that we're, 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 we we're floundering like everyone else to come up with much, much better ideas than we had yesterday. Uh, and, and we are doing some of them, you know, it's part of it is just making sure in all of your public messaging and your tweets and things like that, that it's not a parade of old white dudes, uh, which it often is in our industry. Um, I, I personally have made a commitment and I think a lot of my colleagues are starting to, like I, I won't, if, uh, when, whenever conferences start again, I won't appear on mantles anymore. Um, you know, there's gotta be at least some, some diversity of demographics in addition to diversity of opinion and, and things like that. And those, those are little easy commitments that actually do, uh, I think help. Um, but we got to do some big things as well. Um, there's a, another announcement that came out today, and all kudos to our sister company. Uh, we're participating, but it was their idea. Uh, Virgin Galactic has just committed $100,000 to start a new scholarship program for Black leaders in aerospace. Uh, we're working with them both to contribute financially to the scholarship program, but also to craft mentorship around that, to craft uh, pathways to full-time careers and internships uh, around that to craft ongoing education for people once they get into the workforce, because the, I think you got to be pretty pretty sustained and, and pretty consistent in that. Um, and we're going to try a bunch of things, and I suspect some of them will work better than others. Um, and I hope we'll I hope we will continue to be as transparent as Dan has let us be. <laughs> Dan has asked us to be. I shouldn't say let us. Uh, be, he's asked us to be um, uh, in the future about yeah what worked and what didn't. Um, because I, I think the only way that the world has a prayer of advancing anywhere near as quickly as it as it needs to is if we're all sharing, if we're not repeating each other's mistakes, if we're all trying new things and, and learning from each other's successes and 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 making making new mistakes on our way towards a, a genuine effort to do sustainable good. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, I think you proactively answered a couple of the questions about, you know, how we have feeders for internships and mentoring and support programs. So I'm sure when we return to normal a little bit more, we'll be seeing more and more of that as you guys grow in Long Beach. So that's great. Um, another question that came through the chat, um, what's the best way for individuals to contribute to the broader space effort? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's, uh, I haven't come up with my post COVID answer for that. <laughs> so I'm gonna sort of recycle my pre COVID question and, and then try to have some asterisks around it for things that have changed. I think in general, the good news is it's actually way easier for people who care about aerospace to get involved in aerospace than it ever was. You know, it used to be because aerospace missions were so expensive and they happened so rarely, there wasn't anything you could do, right? If, if, you, if, you were, if you were smart, if you were a talented engineer and you said, hey, I'm willing to work 10 hours a week on this stuff, everyone would say, 10 hours didn't do me any good. Like, what, are you kidding? We're sending people to the moon, what, what, whatever else it is. Uh, if you had a little bit of money you wanted to donate, you know, no one was, NASA doesn't accept donations. You, you already pay taxes and the military doesn't really either. And, and you know, there, there wasn't really any way to contribute to it. What we're seeing now is, although all of those big national programs are still around and still doing great, you know, both NASA and the military space community um, are doing fantastic. They've been doing well under President Trump. They were doing well under President Obama. It's a fairly nonpartisan issue, thank goodness. Um, um, so, the big space programs haven't gone anywhere, but now we just have this influx of new space programs. And there's lots of tiny little startups and there's lots of student led programs and nonprofit initiatives that are like actually building satellites and flying them. Uh, and they're actually, uh, you, you can now, you know, with software as a service and big data and everything else that's happened in other industries, you can do so much more with the existing aerospace uh, uh, data that comes down from satellites. So you can contribute to nonprofit programs that are taking satellite imagery that wasn't collected, it was collected for a military purpose or a weather purpose, but now you can use them to do everything from monitoring um, illegal fishing and figuring out whenever you know, a boat sort of suspiciously has its transponder fail right as it's going next to a, uh, a restricted fishing zone. Or uh, you know, there was, I feel like it's a million years ago, but pre COVID and, and pre uh, all the recent uh, protests, a lot of people were concerned about slash and burn in the Amazon rainforest and how that was happening at this hugely increasing rate. And you can actually go as a citizen who just has a computer and an hour of free time and like help classify that data and say, uh huh, here's where the loggers are going and they're following this road and they say that they're growing sugarcane, but actually they're growing this or whatever else and, and feed data meaningfully in, into, into programs. Um, so there's a lot more of that stuff. The other nice thing um, that has happened for our community, uh, I don't know if this is a nice thing for the world in general, but for our community, I would say Twitter is really nice. Um, there is a great community uh, of space Twitter, you know, a lot of aerospace professionals, and a lot of fans who are really active. They're very open to answering questions. They love to inspire kids. They love to talk with sort of adult fans and enthusiasts because um, that because again that's what most of us are we're, we're space nerds I, I like hanging out with space nerds it doesn't matter if you work in the industry if you work in a totally another other industry if you you got interesting ideas or you want to ask questions as y'all can probably tell i will talk non-stop for hours and hours and hours about this stuff because uh because i really like it uh, and so it's become easier and ever easier than ever to go and engage with um educators science communicators but also the ceos and the astronauts themselves and and a bunch of other thought leaders in our industry so so those are all great ways to do it um, you can also, for those of you here in Long Beach, you can contribute to, uh, it just so happens that Cal State Long Beach has some awesome programs um, in, uh, in, in aerospace. They've been building uh, really cool rocket programs for many, many years. They were building small rockets before that was cool. Um, and so if you're, if you're an alum, if you're a booster, if you're just a neighbor and you want to, uh, you know, call over to the aerospace engineering department or the student chapter of Aeros uh, American uh, Industry. Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, or the students for the exploration and development of space, and say, "Hey, I got a twenty-five dollar check. Can I send it in?" You know, students can do a lot with twenty-five bucks, uh, and so there's starting to be more, more and more of those kind of ways. And I think most of them are COVID resilient. Uh, not, not quite all of them because you can't go to the conferences, and and it's you, you. Uh, although people did, you really shouldn't go watch a launch in Florida. Um, that's not a good thing to do. Is awesome. Go, go watch a lot of launches after COVID, but don't go right now. Uh, so some of those have gone away, but th there's plenty of other cool opportunities. Cool. 
Um, what's your favorite space themed movie and how accurate would you rate it from one Oof. to 100, 100 being the most accurate? It's a good question. I watch, I watch them all, even the terrible ones. And I, I usually get a kick out of the, the really awful ones there, you know, Armageddon or whatever is hilarious, even though it's horrible in every technical aspect, uh, but it's a great popcorn movie. I would say probably my overall favorite is probably 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, and considering the time at which that was made, it is shockingly accurate. I mean, it is astoundingly, uh, I, I don't know about the, you know, the monolith and the, uh, <laughs> and the, the star baby at the end, but, uh, but a lot of the, a lot of the ways that they showed zero gravity, a lot of things that they showed about the design of the spacecraft and the way the intera astronauts interacted with it. And I think most importantly, you know, the pacing of it all. Everything in space, um, even though it's moving really fast relative to each other, it moves very, very slowly and it's all silent. And usually Hollywood tends to speed everything up and add pew pew sound effects, uh, which are fun, but uh, 2001 sort of gets that pacing right. Right. Um, we're almost at time here, so I'm gonna just ask one more question. Um, what is next for uh, Virgin Orbit? What's, what's on the forefront after your mission last month and what can we look forward to? Yeah, so it's getting back up and doing our next flight and going further um, next time around and doing that as quickly as we can. Um, as I have declared freely many times in this call, I'm a big aerospace nerd um, and uh, I love the space history as well as the space present. Uh, so I, I have a big, uh, believe it or not, I have a big spreadsheet on my computer of every rocket that humans have ever built and attempted to fly to orbit. And I don't have every flight of every rocket, but I've got at least the first couple flights of, of every rocket. Um, and uh, I, I've spent a lot of time over the last year or two sort of obsessing with it, uh, over one particular statistic, which is what's the industry-wide average for how long it takes to go from the first flight of a rocket to the second flight of the same rocket. And what I discovered was that industry average is uh, about a year. It's 358 days or something else like that. Um, and one thing that really surprised me was that actually that time period is totally independent of how successful the first flight was. If first flight was a glowing success, which is rare, but does happen, a year. If first flight blew up on the launch pad, a year. It's uh, unchanged. Um, statistically, it's like identical, which is kind of crazy to me. Um, I discovered, uh, I, and I, I just didn't understand that. You know, I come from a science background. I've been doing businessy stuff and wearing neither of those hats did that, did that make any sense to me. I just sort of said, well, obviously if you have a successful launch, your next flight should be way faster. And if you blow up on the launch pad, you're going back to the drawing board. You might not even know why you might even have good data about why you blew up on the launch pad. It's going to take you forever to be confident enough to go out and do it again. Um, so I couldn't figure it out until I, I went and did what I should have done at the start. And I, I went and talked to my much smarter colleagues, particularly to our manufacturing engineers who sort of run the factory. And I showed them that number that said, yeah, it makes total sense. No surprise at all. And I said, okay, walk, walk me through it. I, I, gotta, I gotta know why. And they said, okay, here's what happens. You do your flight, um, whether it goes well or it goes poorly, it takes about a month to analyze the data and have a pretty good idea of what happens. So that's a month after a success or a failure. Because even if you succeeded, Chances are you had some really close calls um, where you came very close to a bad day, but you had a good day. And you got to go and find those things before you repeat that failure and have a worse outcome. You, know, you don't want to flip the coin again on the, on the next flight. So you spend about a month. Um, and then basically every rocket ever built takes 10 months to build. Uh, so you got a month, they got 10 months to build their next launch. And because people don't usually build a rocket two until they've flown launch one, it doesn't matter whether launch one succeeded or failed. It's 10 months. And then you spend about a, a month rehearsing and practicing for your next flight. So that thing, that's one plus 10 plus one, that's 12 months. And it, nowhere in there was there a, a variable that changed based on success. Um, so what we said was, boy, I'd really like to skip that 10 months in the middle. Um, and thankfully, um, our rockets are a lot smaller and therefore a lot cheaper to build than most existing markets. And also we're paying for this privately. We're not using taxpayer dollars. I think if we tried to use taxpayer dollars to build rocket number six before we knew if rocket number rocket number one was going to work, um, we'd have a, a lot of public outcry for for all the right reasons. That seems really like a, a imprudent use of funds. But thankfully, we're sort of spending one guy's money, and he said, hmm, "Well, I can think about how much it costs me to build six rockets, and I can also think about how much does it cost me to run our company for six times ten months 
And yeah, let's go ahead and build the next six rockets. That sounds pretty good. Even if the rocket totally fails and we got to throw it out, it didn't cost me that much money. You know, we can build six of our rockets for the price of one of most other ones. So yeah, let's let's take the leap of faith. Um, so what we're focused on now is taking that year long average between flight one and flight two and making it much less than that, you know, half that, quarter that, whatever is the fastest that we can do. Because I'm really freaking eager to get up and fly again and, and to have a picture of something we built in Long Beach that made it to space. Uh, and we got a bunch of customers that are sitting around uh, waiting for us to fly. And they're not just twiddling their thumbs. They're, uh, they're either finding other rides or they're losing money or they're, you know, whatever else. And, and we, we want to be a customer service focused organization. We've got to start serving our customers in order to do that. So that, that's really the, the whole focus is get into, get into the next flight, make it to orbit, and then don't wait a long time between flight two and flight three. Have a, have, get to this high rate that most people take a, many, many years to get to. Let's get there right out of the gate. We, we've spent the money and the time doing it. Now we just got to go and, and execute. That's awesome. Well, we're, we're almost at time here. There's a couple of extra questions, but Will's offered to take some of these questions offline. So I'll circle back and get some answers for folks. Um, well, I just want to thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for supporting our business day and, and letting us uh, you know, explore Rocket Factory. I know a lot of people, um, a lot of companies probably don't want to open up shop and let people know how things are done, but it's always been great to, to see your experiences and, and to be able to tour that factory. And a special thank you for what you did uh, during the COVID times and uh, on all the diversity campaigns you guys have going on. It's really exciting to see you guys in our backyard. And I'm really excited to see what Virgin Orbit has in, in its future. So um, thanks for joining us. Um, we'll circle back with questions, but everybody have a good rest of your day and a good weekend. And we'll, we'll be uh, tuned in for another fireside chat coming up soon. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. I look forward to answering some more questions over email. Awesome. Thank you, Will. Have a great day. Cheers.